ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Lucy East Hope is a proud daughter of Liverpool in the north of England. When she was 10 years old, Lucy was in the living room with her dad, watching Liverpool Football Club play a semi-final on TV when all hell broke loose. The Hillsborough disaster, as it came to be known, was a fatal crowd crush at the Hillsborough Stadium, which ultimately claimed the lives of 97 people, many from Lucy's own community. Lucy remembers her dad shouting at the TV, someone needs to sort this. And Lucy has dedicated her life to doing that. She is one of the UK's top emergency planners. When a plane crashes, a bomb explodes, a city floods, Lucy's phone begins to ring. But in case you're imagining a sleek, athletic James Bond type surrounded by high-tech wizardry, Lucy describes herself as short, round and somewhat hobbled by arthritis. There are no magic buttons or secret weapons at her disposal. Instead, Lucy relies on her years of experience, careful observation and attentive listening, and a lot of old-fashioned heart. Lucy has learned that while the world can't be controlled, there is a lot that can be planned for when there is the will to do so. She also knows firsthand that as long as there have been disasters, there have also been people like her heading out to help. Her best-selling memoir is called When the Dust Settles. Hi, Lucy. Hello. Lucy, having been exposed to and, and getting very curious about disasters as a child, you studied law at university and then did a master's in emergency management. And just after 9-11, you got your first job in the field of disaster management and planning at a private emergency firm called Kenyan Emergency Services. What was the job interview like? I remember it as quite brief. I think I probably became very passionate and excited and 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 uh, had lots to say. Um, it was in the days that will be very shocking to the, the youth of probably Britain and Australia today, where um, your bosses smoked the whole way through. <laughs> <laughs> Such things are not allowed anymore, kids. So I was, it was through a cloud of, of, of cigarette smoke. And I, I actually was sort of woefully unprepared, probably in some ways. And they gave me some money to go and buy a dark suit for kind of memorials and formal occasions. And then some more money to go and buy my go bag and my cargo pants. Um, so that was that's, that's mostly what I remember about it. And who employed this, the services? Who, who would employ Kenyan? What kind of organisation? Um, pretty much everybody, yeah. I mean, the, the idea that you have standing uh, troops as a as a government or a charity or a military are um, are a little bit of a misnomer in disaster management. You have call off contracts. So the Australian government have hired them several times. The British government hire them. Um, airlines will hire them. So you're on you're in this kind of constant state of of readiness. Mm-hmm. And uh, I often describe it as the worst of times and the best of times because you get a lot of experience very quickly, but you also are you know, you're constantly at the, the, the sort of face of terrible times. You never get a good day. There's no, in, in something like a fire or ambulance response, you might get to see a, a you know, a, a saving story. You might get to rescue the cat from the tree. You don't, you don't get good days. We, we only responded to mass fatality incidents. But it was the best of times in the sense of experience, but also that point about you seeing people going in to help. You always see the aftermath. And, and I think actually, I mean, one of the things they've told me since is that they, since the book came out, they've had this massive interest in recruitment mm-hmm. <laughs> because I think people are very drawn to the idea of, of what can I do? What can I do after these things? And that was, I, I got to see that. And that, that's the, that's the hugest of privileges. Were there many women working in that world when you joined? 
in certain fields. So there's certain aspects of the forensic field that you see higher levels of, of women in, sometimes in crime scene, uh, forensic anthropology, which looks at the bones and, and cremated remains that had always had uh, slightly higher levels of, of women scientists. There, w- there were certainly women uh, colleagues, but I think it was in design quite a, a macho and masculine world. It was, it was similar to a lot of areas like military and, and, and emergency response where women had started to make up higher numbers, but the kit and the uniform was still designed for men. You know, the space was still designed for men and the working arrangements were still designed for men. There would be, you know, one port loo for example. The first disaster response that you were put in charge of was a helicopter crash. A helicopter had gone down in the North Sea. And for you, Lucy, the first obstacle really was how to get to the site. Why was that a problem for you? Yeah, well, you mentioned the job interview and they they just hadn't asked whether I had a driving license. I didn't give it any thought. I'd always just got to wherever I needed to be, you know, somehow, and I didn't drive. And I'm I'm quite severely dyspraxic. And, and what what it turned out was mum and dad had always known that, you know, and I, I wasn't very, very very good at sports and the PE teacher tended to put me in, such a, in, in charge of refreshments. Um, <laughs> But I, they sort of, I think mum and dad collectively had masked it. And then at university, actually, it had been diagnosed. And what that means is that I, I really struggle with coordination, um, a little bit of kind of bodily impulse control, right and left. And of course, I think it's better now. I hope it's better now. But in the sort of late 90s, that was very much... Uh, linked to, say, your intelligence, um, particularly, you know, you mentioned that I'd, I'd studied law, how you kind of hold yourself, being in charge of your papers. And these were all things that I found quite difficult. And, and my biggest nemesis had been learning to drive. And I had really tried and I tried sort of dyspraxic specific lessons and all these kind of things, but I, I really struggled. And so I just didn't drive. And they said, you know, the call had come in in the middle of the night and they said, right, you need to get to the car hire, um, car hire place and hire your car. And I said, I, I don't drive. And that was the first kind of moment <laughs> where I think they started to wonder, you know, I've been, I've been very uh, competent in other areas, but what, what have they hired? But fortunately, my wonderful colleague, Alan, who got me out of all sorts of scrapes over the years, just hired the car with me. And, and we, he- you know, we headed off to, uh, to Norfolk together. Alan was a funeral director. What sort of things did you learn from him? I have learned everything from him and and continue to learn from him. There's a, it's not always just about the role. Sometimes it's about the man. And I think there are certain people that come into your life. He would, the minute that call came in, you know, that, that said that the, that the disaster had happened, the tragedy had happened, he would go and put the kettle on. And that's a lesson for all of us in life, you know, put the kettle on, um, take a moment, take time, um, don't lose your head. Um, he would be incredibly soothing, incredibly, um, incredibly wise, just genuinely wise. And when we, when we got to the crash, there was some uh, mortuary logistics that they wanted us to do, but the main thing they put in, uh, us in charge of was what we call the personal effects, so the, the belongings that had been recovered from the um, scene. And that, that, I think, defined me at that point, really. They, those have always been incredibly important to me. So he, he, took, sort of, he, took, he took charge of that and, we, and we, we encountered that together. And so you were collecting these, these items that had been retrieved from the freezing North Sea. Did you take them, you know, straight to a lab or a warehouse or, or somewhere like that? No, they came home with me and that you know, in, into the bed and breakfasts, you know, motel, and they, 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 they were with me. And I, I felt a profound sense of responsibility for them. And then the next day we took them to our, our warehouse. Um, and I think that's, a, that's an intimacy that, that often surprises people, that you would, you know, you would keep these things that safe. Then what was your step once you'd had them in a, in a warehouse? What, what was your job? So I think often what people don't realise with with these kind of tragedies is we don't always have a a full person to return or we will try and facilitate viewing of whatever we can return, but there isn't always a a, a body in the way that people understand it to return. So the personal effects, and that can be anything, there's not really huge financial value. You know, sometimes I'll see no claims at all on a Rolex watch from an air crash. These are things like chewed pens, scarves, socks, 
um in this case it was it was multiple wash bags that's what i always remember you know the razor the shaving foam and i think one of the biggest lessons of my life has been the comfort that the family and and those around the the lost person they they take from those items and i will fiercely protect them so the next stage generally is to is to dry them out which means that you spend a lot of time with them to inventory them for you know photograph them and then you you get them back to the family as best you can. There are two types of items. There are associated items. So those are things that we have either retrieved directly from the body or are named. So things like passports. Or there are what we call unassociated items gathered from the scene. And that's, that's incredibly hard because you're asking the families to basically look through a series of, of photographs and say, yes, that is his. And that, gosh, you know, the things that we ask families to do in those in those weeks after and, and that gets so little attention i think people move on in the rest of the world so quickly and this is just beginning mm. for those families and in what condition lucy are those items returned those kind of everyday items uh, i mean are they cleaned up if they've been in a, a fire or, or an explosion for example well that's probably been one of the most important parts of my work so I started working in the 1990s and there was a sort of seismic change about how we would think about these items. And there had been legislation uh, passed in America, which is, which is mirrored actually in transportation codes in Australia, to give families more choice. Because one of the things that we'd seen after disasters uh, like Lockerbie and uh, an air crash in Nova Scotia was that people would very earnestly and very kindly repair, launder, and sort of condition with fabric conditioner and perfume the items that they would recover. And the families had sort of, you know, thanked them through gritted teeth, but many of the families had been deeply distressed by that. They'd said, we want them back as is. And actually it was the Hillsborough disaster where I'd done some particular learning that that the um, the arrangements had been made for the football shirts to be washed and laundered and repaired. And many of the, you know, young men and women had their lucky shirt and had their rituals, you know, the, the, the rip had always been in it for as long as they've been following the team. They didn't wash their shirt until the end of the, the uh, championship, all of those kind mm. of things. So, so I'm actually fiercely protective of the idea that we return them, what we call in the American law, as is, unless the families are, uh, they're, they're given the information and they, they can request further works. Uh, so we will remove um uh, stainage if they want us to but the right to as is is something that i protect there is there is some changes that we may have to insist on so for example for biohazard reasons we will say we have to do some basic sanitization but the other thing is we don't repair um something like a watch so that it works again that's really important because with a watch often the families will interpret that as the moment it stopped and the moment life stopped so if we've gone and cleaned up the face and we've put in new batteries, we've, we've, we've taken that away. That's not what the personal effects process is about. The separate compensation for the loss of the item, you know, tangibly, this is about the loss of a link to their loved one. And, and that is the returning of that. You were on the, the London Tube on the morning of 7th of July 2005 when suicide bombers struck London's transport system and when there are multiple victims like in those terrible bombings how are the bodies of, of individuals identified how complex is that process yes absolutely and the irony with that one I was actually traveling to a meeting to look at how we would care for people in the event of that sort of an incident and then it happened there and then so i had the i had the plans in my in my rucksack on on that day and and you know i mean my life is full of those coincidences and ironies and i think that's true of, of all emergency planners really so we we sign up to an interpol process uh, both in the uk and australia um which is called disaster victim identification or it's known in our world we use a lot of acronyms as dvi and that is a process by which we use uh, scientific means, fingerprints, teeth, uh, DNA, and sometimes medical uh, implements, so things like uh, implants, uh, to identify the person. 
we will also build up a broader picture so things like you know, secondary identifiers maybe a, an identification badge on their clothing that sort of thing and sort of other medical and biological descriptions this inevitably takes time and that's one of the most difficult things to explain um, most people don't know that this is the process that that's used they can uh, be very shocked at the idea of being asked for dna for example literally in the worst hours of their lives they don't they don't have any confirmation that their loved one is 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 dead they're just asked for their dna and we try and do that very sensitively and in these what we call family and friends reception centers but it's a very difficult process and we we train a lot but the one group you know the one group we're not training for the one group not in the room are the future families we will be asking so that's mm. that's always in the back of my mind but we literally signed off both the plans and the mortuary for that sort of attack seven days before the 7th of july and did they go into into place the way that you had anticipated very much so actually they were they were very much activated and actually i look back on that time as there was a lot of resource there was a lot of harmony um, there'd been some rapid learning, there'd been some big failures, probably globally, I mean, both Australia and UK did substantial reviews of its um, response to the Indian Ocean tsunami in the Boxing Day 2004. So there had been um, a lot of learning from that and also obviously the world had desperately tried to learn and bring meaning to the events of September 11th, 2001. And the the attacks on 9-11 had really transformed the way we use DNA in these settings. So my career is sort of starting alongside, sort of the starting gun has been fired alongside how we will use DNA. And we're, we're still sort of experimenting and trialling on that. And of course, you know, all science ends up interacting with human and social factors. So sometimes in families there are very complicated ideas of biological kinship the, the the dad isn't always the biological dad so we, we we're trying to navigate big sort of human problems at the same time as learning about the science so those years felt very fast in terms of learning about identification and for you personally lucy have you ever been afraid or or squeamish around dead bodies and human remains the dead themselves have always been my my kin. I've never felt afraid. Sometimes some places will want to sort of show that they're very they're very willing to get the job done. So they'll try and run, say, the mortuary operations twenty four hours a day. And there's certainly there's certainly an eeriness to those spaces in the middle of the night. But I've never felt afraid. And I think one of the things I've really noticed with social media now that we've got several very difficult conflicts going on around the world is I think what I'm seeing is it's the first time people are seeing those images constantly 24 7 and just the brutality of something like an airstrike on a human body and I think you know people are, are saying to me you know how can you live with these images in your head and what you have to do is is see the person in the fragments you have to remember they are you and they are us and they are they are kin and originally I would say things, you know, before the book was out, I would say these images have never traumatised me. But then I realised that the danger with that is that, that I'm diminishing other people's distress. Mm. Just because I could make sense of them didn't mean that everybody has to. But for me, they just always felt um, me. They were always me. And that might be a, a fragment of scalp or a finger. They were just always me. One disaster that Australians are very familiar with are floods. You know, many people are still homeless following devastating floods in, in the Northern Rivers area of New South Wales in, in 2022. Tell me about the community that you got to know after floods hit England in 2007. Oh, the wonderful toll bar <laughs> in Doncaster. Just the most wonderful place, you know, the place that taught me everything about disaster aftermath everything about disaster survivance everything about listening so this wonderful uh village a, a, a long heritage a mining history and it, its topography means that it sits in a basin essentially so it was very vulnerable when it did flood and it kind of sat in the flood water uh in 2007 after um, britain had been ravaged by flooding and it's where I centred my PhD research. And so I actually went back and forth in total for about seven years and beyond to watch this place 
try and you know kind of come back I don't like the word recovery I'm not even sure I like the word recovering you know I just try and fight back it was a place that was sort of between two villages so it could have easily got lost and it wasn't going to and what I also observed was kind of the official ideas of recovery targets you know that we will have got that road built back or we'll have put this number of people back in their homes and just the reality you know children six years later who would still wet themselves when it rained um but also little little flashes of post-traumatic growth you know the woman who had been in a very domestically violent relationship and, and basically rarely left home is is basically flooded out by the water gets a job in the flood recovery leaves her husband is built back and becomes a local poet you know this this most amazing uh moments of what it is to live through and of course the other thing just as in australia these places will flood again mm. so you don't get to say you know with the right with the right uh circumstances and tools you never need to see these dark days again you have to say to this community give it six months you need to do all this again and one of the one of the reviews that means the most of most to me actually is an australian review that says what could this place teach us in australia that floods so often and and, and it says you know what unifies australia and england and so many other places is this grim chronic aftermath of flooding and this rebuild that comes with flooding and and i have many friends in australia and it's the flooding chapter in that and my earlier writing about flooding that we probably talk about mm. the most just back to Tollbar and your experience there, Lucy, why did the residents give you the nickname Skip Lady? Oh, as you've heard before, well before 2007, I've become very passionate about the protection of personal effects. But what I was finding was they were only protected for certain types of incidents, you know, the big no notice crash or explosion. And flooding, we just expected everybody to kick everything out of their houses. There was lots of messaging about the dangers of flood water. And people would be told, clear it out, the insurers are coming. And, and the insurers did something quite brutal. They would say that they didn't want to pay twice. They didn't want to double bubble. <laughs> so you had to show that everything had been destroyed. And if it, if, it was, if it was not fully destroyed, you had to break it up with an axe in front of them, say, if it was a piece of furniture. And this just seemed so incongruous to the way we did other types of disaster. But the worst thing was people took that message and they, they ran with it. And, you know, the, the, the skips, the, the big, you know, kind of waste management was full of passports, baby scan photos, photo albums, war medals. And, and I was like, it doesn't mean that. You know, we can save that. We can wipe those down. We can dry those. And so I, you know, as, as is my way, I took on a big fight with the British insurers at that point <laughs> because this, this, it wasn't fair on the people. And, and what we were finding, and of course, disaster sociologists had written about this for decades. You know, Kai Erickson had written about this after floods in the 70s, was people lost their magpie hoard. They lost their furniture of self. They lost everything. So then you put them, even if you found them a new home, you, it wasn't a home because they had nothing from the life before. Some things had to go, you know, soft furnishings, clothes, the child's bush chair. We could replace that. But they had no photographs. They had no documents from the life before. The flood water didn't do that. We did that to them. And that was a big realisation for me. And it's something you'll see me really champion on social media, sometimes to my own detriment. It's, it's the area I'll get the biggest pylons <laughs> is if I say, you know, please try and save the following documents, the following war medals, the following photographs. I had one member of parliament say in the media here, you know, there's a crazy academic telling people to fish around in the pond water and, and you know, and risk their lives to rescue their war medals. So it's not, you know, people think these messages are easy sometimes in the aftermath. It's much easier to say to a community, get rid of everything. That's a nice, simple five or six word statement. And so that was the that was the battle of, of the being the skip lady. There's a, a Welsh word that you use to describe the particular trauma that comes with flooding. What is it? Oh, it's the most wonderful word, heraith, the, the loss of the life before, an echo, a heart sickness for a life that isn't coming back. And I'd first read about it in the disaster context in the relation in, in relationship to the terrible Aberfan disaster in 1966, which killed so many people and so many of them were children. And I think that has scarred this nation forever. 
and uh, some of the the writers and the poets about that had used the word hiraith and and um, it's it's a word that just seems to work and seems to travel and it's the recognition of of what you had before is 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 gone and it means that you carry on you know but there's always a there's always a, a memory and a scar Podcast and broadcast. This is Conversations with Sarah Konoski. Find more conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app. Lucy, what does belonging to this unique tribe that you belong to, the tribe of disaster specialists, what does it mean for your other relationships, particularly back when you were starting out? So I think, you know, one theme in the book is how hard it it was to bring the work home. Uh, you know, even when we're talking now, I, I'm careful what I say in case some of it is is too graphic, too much for people to hear. You 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 start censoring almost immediately. Um, you know, I might come from the the helicopter crash that we talked about before, and then be going to a a friend's wedding, and people ask you what you do, and you learn to mask and you learn to censor. Literally, not bringing it home to Tom, my husband, who is an airline pilot, mm. and he he was you know, having to fly and uh, loving to fly. And, and, and there was this wife who sometimes smelt of kerosene and aviation fuel and, and had a, a bag of, of, of men's wash bags ready to take into the warehouse. So I learned to censor it. And I think one of the things that, you know, only now I've really come to value, there are, there are small groups of us emergency planners who debrief together. We demob, we talk together. And one of the things that scares me in our practice at the moment is as as times get tough, places like police headquarters will do away with things like their canteen. You know, I I was training in a police headquarters last week and there was nowhere. All the sitting areas were empty and the canteen has been shut for cost reasons. There's nowhere to go to talk intimately with the people that you you work with and so I've I've always balanced that and and those are the people I'm most honest with I think one of the biggest changes for me was becoming a mum and I was as I said even as a child it was never anxiety it was always interest and curiosity but what I've had to learn is is to shut a little bit of that away and particularly try and manage the distraction you know when I'm working all I want to do is is focus on this event and you know, becoming a mum obviously challenges that, and rightly so. Tom, you fell in love with as as a uni student and supported him in, in this dream he had to become an airline pilot. As a pilot, what was his attitude to risk and the potential for disaster? I mean, was it similar to yours? In many ways, I think we were in, in very similar. I mean, there was this very, very different spectrum because he's trying to prevent and ensure that that what I see every day never happens for him or his passengers. Um, He has, uh, you know, as many aviators do, they borrow a phrase which I think came from NASA, which is, you know, where there is doubt, there is no doubt. And he applies that in all areas of his life. You know, he's very, he's very technically gifted. Um, Unfortunately for me, he's very coordinated. So he kind of balances out (laughs) this praxis, but he can drive, you'll be glad to hear. And he, he was always very measured, very considered. What do you mean um, by that phrase? Just tease that out a little bit. Where, where there is doubt, there is no doubt. So if you have a, a concern about an engineering problem or you're worried about a strange knocking noise or you don't think that the spreadsheet that's just been dropped off in the cockpit is entirely accurate, you don't wing it <laughs> for an aviation pun. You you stop. Everything stops. You know, so so living with him, if there's a if there's a knocking noise on the car or something, we don't well let's see how we get on till the next service station. He he stops. And I think probably I've come to realise how important that is to my psyche because of course my life is made up of of what we call the Swiss cheese model, moments where engineers, company directors 
fire personnel had the had the moment to stop something and they didn't they carried on so actually i think that quality is something that is so comforting to me mm. Tell me about the experience that that Tom had with flying British holidaymakers home from a terrorist attack in Tunisia and how that gave him an insight into the importance of what you do. Oh, yes. So this was the um, the shooting of, of holidaymakers in Tunisia. Actually, all Tom can ever think about really is that he took them to their holiday as well. So he, he, he flew them out there. And one of the things you learn working in disaster response is you see uh, the ripple effect, as we call it in disaster studies, and, and the toxic uh, kind of survivor guilt that people far removed from the initial moments will feel. You know, often you'll see incredible trauma, for example, in an engineer who signed off a flight before it took off. And he he had flown them out, and then word came in that uh, 30 of them had been had been shot. And I was responding alongside the holiday company and on a call with police and the foreign office. And the holiday company were calling from their control centre and they were identifying captains who could go out and retrieve the the survivors and the bereaved. And uh, one of them said quietly to me, uh, Thomas East Hope is on the top of that list, we're sending him now. And I worked with them and, and they were incredible, you know, and often there's a sort of a smugness in the public sector that they do emergency planning well. But my experience has always been that the private sector do it very well as well. And particularly airline crisis teams, they're just heartbroken when anything happens to their passengers or their craft. And they needed a script for the captains to read out. Tom and I, obviously, he was he was restless. He knew he was flying out early the next morning. I was working on the script. I sent it to the holiday company, they they tweaked it and moments later it appeared in his email inbox for him to read out. And one of the things about emergency planning is we do a lot on pieces of paper. That's all it is, you know, spreadsheets. We train on PowerPoints, we, all those kind of things. He, he said to me afterwards, it didn't look enough. It didn't look enough as a document. And then he read it out to his passengers. He explained to them that, you know, they were so very sorry and when they got back they would do everything they could for them and one thing he had to let them know was that counter-terror police would be waiting to interview them and he knew that would be difficult and what he said to me was you know when I went to work with a piece of paper I didn't think it would do very much you know I'd seen you work on a hundred pieces of paper late at night I didn't get it and then I saw what reading that out did in the cabin and I understood what you did. What did it do, Lucy? Why was that message, which, yeah, as you say, is quite a simple one, what is the, at the heart of what made that so important? Do you know, I think that's what so much of my work is about. It's about telling people, we are walking alongside you, there are arms around you, we don't know everything, but we've got some of this, we've got some technical legitimacy here, we, we, will, we will do our very best, we're in your camp. You know, we will get you what you need. Come to us, because sometimes counter-terror police might forget to get you a cup of tea, but we will. You know, all those things. And that calms. You know, you see it working on the, the nervous system. You see people thinking, OK, I've seen the logo. I've got a card copy of the leaflet. I know what I need to do now. These people say they've got me. I'm going to believe them. And and that, for me, is is 90% of what emergency planning is. Hmm. You mentioned that phrase that, that Tom and other pilots use of, if in doubt, there is no doubt. Does intuition, you know, our gut instincts, have a role in the assessment of risk for everyday people? Oh, I love exploring this because, yes, hugely. And I think it's been one of the most common, you know, common things that people have asked me at book festivals, you know, normal people <laughs> sidling up to me saying, are we allowed to use our intuition anymore? <laughs> like, it's... It's trained out of us, isn't it? And yet it's there in nature. You know, when, when we, in the tsunami warnings, the animals and the birds are all allowed to use their intuition, but we're supposed to use something else. I don't know, I don't know what spreadsheet probably. Oh, intuition is so important. And of course, a lot of our intuition comes from uh, you know, verbal clues, non-verbal clues, nature, the animals moving, the weather is coming, something in our gut instinct. You know, I'm a big fan of things like understanding the gift of fear, all of these kind of things. And, and what I would say to people is do not be afraid of, of listening to that. And the link, and I think Australia has always got this right, the link between 
understanding things may happen and perhaps trusting your gut, but also citizen preparedness, so having things ready. Uh, you are much better than the UK at, at talking to citizens about things like, um, you know, traveling in, in the outback or having things ready for extreme weather. There's a, there's a sort of British exceptionalism that says, well, that's not our job sometimes mm -hmm. as citizens, you know. But I think it's linked to, to intuition because if you feel something is not right, act on that act on that and that, that's something that's been trained out of us the last the last few decades the way you understand intuition lucy it's not like it's some sort of mystical woo woo from the beyond it's almost like our our brains and bodies are scanning information or our bodies are scanning for information before our brains are processing what's happening but it's responsive to signals that that part of us is somehow aware of in the environment we're in it it's sort of good data it's very good data, and I think that's what that's what I would really like people to to think about. It, it's very complex, you know. A detective saying um, quite sarcastically, "How many survivors will talk about? Well, I just had a voice in my head to move." You know, and that that's a very difficult um, that's a very difficult thing to say out loud because, of course, the bereaved families will understandably interpret that as saying, "You know, well, your well, your loved one didn't have good intuition. There are certainly going to be many situations where intuition doesn't play a part at all. I think what we are struggling with uh, in society is helping children particularly to understand things like risk. We, our, our messaging is very confused and understanding it as processing signs and signals can be very, very useful. Um, I was watching my little girl the other day ride and uh, she was in a competition and she brought the horse up and, and they buzzed her as a fault. And she said to me afterwards, you know, my stirrup didn't feel right. And and I was so proud of her, you know. So she, she'd been buzzed, she'd been eliminated in the competition. She'd had to do a sort of walk of shame out of the arena. But by God, you know, she'd listened to her gut. And, and, and I think that's a really important one. That's the way to make Lucy East Hope proud, for sure. <laughs> yeah, um, listen to your voice. <laughs> as, as you suggested, Lucy, there have been a few notable instances in your life when you've been in the midst of, of running a disaster planning exercise and the kind of scenario you're discussing theoretically starts unfolding in actuality in the real world. Tell me about the training scenario that you were delivering in June 2017. I think that's the very hardest one. So it's the 13th of June 2017. I've been working on a scenario for a couple of years. I've actually been researching aspects of it with a with a number of research grants and it's for a, a fire in an urban tower block in London. It will be very complex. It will be very high temperatures so we will have very limited uh, remains to return to families. There will be uh, issues with multiple languages and uh, English will not be the first language of the families involved. And the real kind of kicker in the scenario was that the organisation that will be blamed is the local authority because the local authority are the ones tasked with all of the kind of people response, all of what we call the human aspects response and the recovery. And all of those aspects of that scenario are written in because I want to test things that I've started to see over and over again in smaller responses. I present the scenario at three o'clock and at five o'clock I'm called a fantasist and six hours later the Grenfell Tower in London burns down and that is the hardest uh, thing I have ever encountered in my work. It's a disaster that should never have happened. It's a disaster where at least 72 people have died and it's a disaster where it will rumble on for, for decades and justice will continue to be denied. And it's taken a long time to, uh, to try and even form a coherent narrative on that. I don't think before I wrote the book I could have even said it so lucidly to you. Mm -hmm. And it's my hiraith. You know, there's a Lucy before Grenfell and there's a Lucy after Grenfell. What was it? Explain more why out of all the, the so many disasters that you had been involved with in your work as an emergency specialist why why this one touched you in the way that it did it was on so many levels it's a it's it's a children's disaster there's so many children killed and so many children affected you know the children then had to watch the response through children's eyes for months afterwards you know watching uh, body bags be removed for 14 weeks 
um, it was, for me, incredibly preventable. You know, sometimes I'll see a, a weather disaster and we couldn't stop that storm. We can try and minimise and mitigate the harms of it, but we weren't going to stop that weather or that earthquake. This was a completely preventable disaster. And it was an utter state failing and, a, and an act of state violence. And I think to see that, it felt like I'd seen it on my watch. And that's very grandiose of me. And I don't mean it like that. But it was so, so preventable. And I think one of the things that had happened in, in world emergency planning globally before 2017 was there was a, um, a, a real focus on terrorism. And there still is, rightly so. But terrorism is always sort of done to us. And we'd got quite complacent by that point that we are perfectly capable as a state of doing those harms ourselves in our own inaction. It's, it's a disaster of greed. It's a disaster of money making. The disaster capitalism continued after the fire. And everything that I'd said I'd set out to do, you know, my dad said in 1989, somebody's got to sort this. And that was what I'd set out to do. And I, it felt like the ultimate failure. Mm. The fact that that very day you'd been trying to convince other people with influence, with power to make decisions that this was a scenario that was likely to happen, you know, it, does it sometimes feel that almost a curse the way that you can see all these risks that most of us are, are oblivious of? I mean, do you see all these dramas about you, you know, like Cassandra that you're aware of, but you can't necessarily stop? Does it feel like that? It, it can do. <laughs> and certainly, you know, I, my grandma graduated in, in Latin and Greek. So Greek myths were a huge part of our um, our childhood. And of course, Cassandra, it doesn't end well for her. It doesn't end well for Cassandra. <laughs> so, so that, you know, that, that kind of stayed with me. The thing, so definitely 2018, it, it felt like a huge curse. And I, and I desperately kind of flailed around, I think, trying to work out what to do. I started to write for some newspapers because the virtue of, of being very trusted, and I still am very trusted and I can be trusted, but, you know, the virtue of working for governments and things is that you, you stay very much below the parapet. I had no social media at all. I've certainly made up for that now, but I had no social media. I was very quiet prior to 2017. I was sort of trying to work out what it was that I what I would do with with this new set of feelings, and what that meant was, by the time of the the pandemic, I was very ready and able to support other colleagues because our entire profession, here Australia, America, all around the world, feels exactly the same as me now about the pandemic. You know, some kind of pandemic was all of our country's most likely and severe national risk you know we borrowed a lot of our risk management appraisal from australia uh, i think basically copied our entire recovery strategy from australia in in 2007 so we had uh, a whole profession that was on its knees in 2020 and i think i was very ready i dealt with a lot of those feelings i'd hardened to a lot of those feelings so when younger planners were and, and i make no bones about this they were suicidal mm. about being ignored and being overruled in the pandemic there were a few of us who were ready to say, no, this is, we go again, you know, and we, we look to the future. And that's, that's what I've always done. You know, there's a horizon and you look to it. I guess the thing with the work that you do is it is by definition trying to prevent terrible things happening or trying to be able to mitigate their worst consequences. So you can't kind of say, see, I told you so when it doesn't happen or when you, we you know, when you have things ready, when the plans go well in place. So it must be a hard one to lobby for in terms of, of government or in terms of, of the public appreciation of, of the importance of having good disaster planning. Oh, you've hit the nail on the head with the challenge. There is, there is no, there's no, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's certainly no moment to say, I told you so in the worst after, you know, I've got a colleague mm. at the moment who's absolutely going through this with an incident that's happened. You can't say, I told you so. And on the other hand, as you, as you rightly say, there's no acknowledgement if you prevent something. And, and, and we call that in emergency planning, the Y2K phenomenon. So um, <laughs> those of us who are old enough to remember, you remember that the world was going to end on the 31st of December, 1990 all of the computers would stop um, and all of the planes would crash and we did so much mitigation work for the Y2K phenomenon and then it was all a bit of a damp squib and we will never know whether it was the work or whether it was the it was never a problem in the first place and that is the horrible burden of emergency planning if you get this right and if you mitigate it and if you swerve some of it 
you never get to be able to see whether you did a good job because you know the fates will say well maybe it wasn't going to be as bad in, in the first place we see that a lot for example with weather warnings and storms we might preemptively evacuate and that's what saves lives but, but it will look like the death toll was obviously nil and people will say it wasn't as bad as it should have been so what i what i wanted to achieve with the book was to really bring us out from behind the curtains because emergency planning as you say is the first thing to go in austerity budget you know it doesn't it doesn't have any votes in it people don't know it's there it's very very hidden so i am a one woman campaign <laughs> to make people understand the value of it what what i do get more and more now a bit like a sort of a, a grand dame of emergency planning is i get to go to events afterwards and tell these weary emergency planners and emergency responders what I know the difference was. You know, you can't say to a community and you certainly can't say to a bereaved, did you like your cup of tea? Because that's new. We put that in. We, we arranged that tea. And what do you think of that cup of tea when they're, wasted, you know, when they're waiting for the worst news of their lives? But I get to go afterwards and say to emergency planners, you know, thank you for doing that. I, I saw the tea urn. And that's what I see my role is now. Lucy, you mentioned, of course, COVID, a global pandemic, which was expected by disaster planners such as yourself. What approach did you take with your own young daughters during that time in terms of keeping their morale up, their spirits up? What did you say to them? I think it was a very, a very different pandemic if you were an emergency planner. And, and there are a few of us in the world, so we were probably all on a similar trajectory. And you were, uh, you were often ahead of other people in some ways you knew what what was coming and you knew what three and five and seven years might look like so that hit me and it actually hit me before we went into lockdown here that the childhood that i had planned for my children and you know i'd really fought to have these these babies i i i you know i suddenly thought well this is the end of everything that they'd they you know they're going to get to experience maybe school will never start again there's no more parties so I use the same sort of philosophy that I think my mum and dad had always used with me. We would get through this by looking outwards. We would get through this by looking, uh, looking after other people. And, and one of the movies I've always found most affecting is Hook. I love Hook. And there's a bit at the end, sorry to spoil it, where, where Peter Pan, uh, Peter Banning, you know, grown up Peter Pan says um, to each of the Lost Boys, uh, you know, you need to look after the person smaller than you. And the littlest lost boy says, who do I look after? And Peter Pan says, the never bugs, who are the smallest creatures on the island. And I knew that if I was going to get the kids through, but also as, as, as kids who would be ready for the world that would, would wait us after the pandemic, they needed to look after the never bugs. So they were in charge of the village response scheme. They were in charge of any newborn babies born. We got out. Um, they saw us deliver food to the older people. They were they were part of that. And also we moved my mum and dad in with us. I'm not sure Tom's forgive me for that, but we did. And we became a we became a six. And behind the closed doors, we tried to keep things as normal as possible. And in fact, actually only last week. Did I, I finally sit down and think I'd been kind of, I, I, you know, I knew I'd been running on quite a lot of adrenaline for some time. So it's what, four years now. And I think those first few days have been, I've got to get the children through. I've got to get the children through. And actually, I don't think that had left me. I don't think I've stopped feeling like that. Mm. And, um, and it wasn't, you know, I've got to keep them free from the virus. I've got to keep them safe. That was a consideration. It was, I need them to be able to come through this and still be the women they were going to be. And that, that was a huge responsibility. Mm. And I think for for what, what I think we're not understanding at the moment is the toll on parents now. We talked a lot about, you know, the, the mental health implications of a pandemic. We don't tend to see that in the acute stage of a disaster. We tend to see it afterwards, the burnout, the adrenal slump, and just trying to get people through. If you were the caregiver in a household has been a huge responsibility and there's no let up. You know, now it's as, as, as demanding as ever. And so I think hats off to everybody who tried to get somebody through the last few years. Uh, the way that you describe that, the, the advice that you gave to your girls of, you know, well, your job will be to look after the never bugs. We're going to look outward. We're going to help where we can. It seems that's one of the paradoxes that's at the heart of disaster response and recovery is that 
when we can, helping others is what really helps ourselves in some deep way. It's human connection. You know, it, 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 it's, it's very important, I think, to have a community to get through. Some of, the, some of the pandemic approaches and philosophies were quite individualistic and uh, quite selfish in many ways. We had to get people through. I do, I often say, you know, the things that get me into most trouble on social media, one of the other things that gets me into most trouble is, is talking about bad help. And bad help is things that we do that, you know, we're trying to forge that human connection. They come from a lovely place within our soul, but they don't actually help. It might not be helpful to rush to the scene. It might particularly not be helpful. And all of our countries are united on this. It's usually not helpful to donate secondhand things. So it's not, it is help, but also it can't be selfish help. Lucy, I must say, you sound remarkably cheerful or ebullient for someone whose bread and butter is disaster. <laughs> Thank you. I, <laughs> I think, you know, it's become really trite and you're not allowed. I don't know if you have the same backlash against affirmations that we, like the British get cynical fast, don't they? So they don't, the, the, you know, things like live, love, laugh on your on your bathroom wall. But I'm all about the affirmations. You know, I was very lucky after Grenfell to find a group of American and Australian army and air force wives that were based near where we lived and they took me in we, we did thursday zumba classes and they danced with me and i was i was i was cheerful before but often it's those women that i credit for rebuilding me and and letting me be who i am and i think that that funny side is an important part of our coping strategies used very delicately but it's something i i'm actually writing about at the moment the role of of smiling and laughter in disaster survivance and and that's uh, very important to me and hopefully a follow-on chapter on the role of zumba and <laughs> ex exuberant dance in such a thing <laughs> lucy without it's... a doubt it's been such uh, such a fascinating subject to learn more about. Thank you so much for being my guest on Conversations. It's been an honour. Thank you. Lucy East Hope's memoir is called When the Dust Settles. And a big thanks, as always, to the Conversations team, our executive producer, Carmel Rooney, and producers Nicola Harrison, Maggie Morris, and Alice Moldovan. I'm Sarah Konoski. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations with Sarah Kanoski. For more Conversations interviews, head to the website abc.net.au slash conversations.